Just say your name, what you do, where you're from. And then you start questions or I just yeah. keep talking? Yeah, then I start questions. Okay. So, who are you? What's your name? Hello, my name is Sean Johnson, Christopher Sean Johnson, according <laughs> to the records. I um, am a long-term resident, local resident of Benzonia. And I say local because I'm not a native. I was born in North Carolina, um, 1954. 1958, my parents moved to Honor, Michigan, um, and my dad started teaching over at Honor High School. He was one of the Honor Knights. I was a cold three-year-old Southern boy who huddled on the register for the next two years. Um, my parents moved over to Benzonia when I was five, and I literally started school over at Crystal Lake Elementary. Mrs. Smeltzer was my kindergarten teacher, um, and I remember very clearly having to lie underneath the drinking fountain when we were supposed to be taking naps and looking at the plumbing because I hated taking naps. And where do I go from there? So what's what's your connection to Benzie County? Again, I'm a local. And yeah. I say that because growing up, it was very clear that the natives, um, if you talk the Grays, the Joys, um, there's different families here where they've been here for generations. Um, the Johnsons, my parents, are, are transplants. There are no other Johnsons in the area. But I am a long-term local. I've lived here since 1958. Um, and the real trick is I lived in what I consider a pivotal time or a changing time. Um, my little brother, Timmy, is four years younger than me, and uh, he calls it um, that he grew up in perfect sync with the Wonder Years. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the show The Wonder Years. It was it came out and was on for a good 10 or 15 years. It followed a young kid, a student, from middle school through high school. And again, it was the same exact time period that my younger brother Tim was a middle school through high school student. All of that said, um, the wonder years were where I lived. Um, you don't live in the wonder years, you live in the millennial years and all those other things. And I say the wonder years because when I grew up, um, we had recreation programs in the summer, we had sliding and skiing in the winter, um, lots of community project, projects and um, all the community stores and businesses were still here. At this point, Benzonia is still Benzonia, Beulah is still Beulah, but all the businesses that I remember as a kid are gone, and that includes the mom and pop grocery store and the, the dime store that was down in Beulah, all of those stores that everybody remembers from their middle or their, their childhood. They're not in Bidzi County anymore. They've all moved to the, the strip malls, etc. So when did you start skiing? Do you know, my dad uh, was a teacher at Bidzi Central, and he... Uh, was from New England. My mom's a Southerner. So again, I started childhood, started life in North Carolina. Um, my parents lived there for two years after the uh, World War II and they were on the GI Bill. And um, again, my mom being a Southerner did, could care less for the winter climates, etc. But my dad was from New Hampshire and he literally grew up in Concord, which is where the world's first ski resorts were. Um, so he had a ski lift back when he was a kid, and he learned to ski, and he always wanted to ski later on. So when he moved to Michigan and found out we were skiing up here, he immediately got back involved in it. Um, part of the wonder years is right over, can't point because I'm on film, but um, Severn Street is where Crystal Lake Elementary is located. Right at the end of Severn Street was the Severn Street sliding hill, and that had rope toads and it had a ski lift. and. Uh, uh, we went skiing and sliding there all the time, and it was all free. It was run by the community. But in any case, my dad taught me to ski there, and that was probably when I was seven or eight. And Crystal Mountain, again, was uh, more expensive, and most of us didn't go out there because it cost too much. But in 1970, my dad started the ski team. Um, and that was literally it was a club that 1970 and 71, and then 71 and 72, it became an actual ski team. And we raced against all the other teams that you kind of hear about nowadays, although back then there was only one division. So we raced against Traverse City and Traverse City St. Francis and Manistee, and there were only about 20 teams in the entire state. Um, so when we had our state finals, it was that same group all the time. In any case, my dad started, uh, started to be skiing there. In 1971, we started skiing out at Crystal Mountain as a, a high school team. And in 72, we had our first high school team. And I became involved in that and have basically stayed involved in the, the ski program at Benzie ever since. Um, 
Again, there have been other coaches involved since my dad passed away in 1977, but uh, like I say, I've kind of kept my finger in it all the time. How many kids did you have originally on your varsity team? Do you know, um, again, dad died in 77. Sorry, but I'm going to take out a picture for you guys. This is one of those you can take a picture of at some point. These are the original pictures of the ski team. Those are 76. Um, and again, when my dad started the team, there were probably 25 to 30 kids on it every year. The um, trick with that original team was, like I say, a lot of us really weren't skiers. We just wanted to try the sport out. Racing back then was not what it is today. Today, you know, they've got computers and breakaway gates and all that other stuff. Back in those days, we used bamboo and someone sat at the bottom of the hill and went one, two, three, and when the hand went down the third time, you took off and they started timing you with a hand timer. Um, so the racing was very, very different back then. You didn't hit gates unless you were Peter Papinaw because everything was bamboo and it hurt. And it also meant you had to reset the course as soon as you broke all the bamboo out. So again, the racing was very, very different, but it was all the same sport. And like I say, it's evolved over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and the cool news is, Benzie's been involved in it pretty much since the beginning. Um, we've had a team early, early on with all the other teams. There's been 50 or 60 other teams that have started in the state since we started a Benzie Central team. But again, when we started back in the 70s, they had only been um, five state finals that had happened. So again, they started high school state racing or ski racing probably in the mid 60s. And by the early 70s, Benzie was part of it. And has had an ongoing team ever since, which I take pride in. And I think Benzie Central kids do too, that we've always had our, our ski team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what were your parents like, your family life? Do you know, you know, <laughs> and I say that because you're a teacher's child. My dad was a teacher out at Benzie. Um, my mom was a librarian right in this library for years. I lost you guys for a moment or two because I was uh, downstairs looking for the plaque. And there's a plaque somewhere in this library that goes through all the old librarians. And for me, um, mom was a librarian here, but not till later on. She was the nursing school teacher here for probably 20 years down in the basement. Um, again, everything's been remodeled since then, but uh, Mom ran that nursery so long that pretty much everyone in the community called her Mrs. Johnson. And again, she was uh, one of those people that everybody grew up knowing who Mrs. Johnson was. My dad was the same way. School was a pretty small um, school at that point. We were a class CD school in the 60s and 70s. Everybody knew who my dad was. Um, and I got in trouble and he knew about it by lunchtime kind of thing. But bottom line is my parents were both pretty religious, fairly quiet, um, non, uh, how would you put it? They didn't go out a lot, kind of thing. They were home with us unless they were at meetings or doing uh, business or school related kind of things. My dad um, was a very popular teacher and he not only taught, but he was the ski coach and I was on the ski team. He was the driver training instructor and I took driver's training, obviously. He was the yearbook instructor and he was the drama instructor. It was one of those where teachers back then you ran into a lot. And so just because he was my dad was one thing, but I also had him as a teacher slash advisor um, in all the different activities I did at school. Good news was all the kids liked him. So it wasn't like I was hooked to a teacher that none of the kids liked much. How did you get out with your siblings? Do you have siblings? Do you know, it's a large family. Um, dad's a Catholic, mom's a Baptist. And uh, there were five kids, I was in the middle, and I always tell people that being in the middle is the best, which is why I was a middle school teacher for 30 years. Um, but I have two older siblings and two younger. Uh, I always figured that my parents quit when they finally got Sarah, which was the fifth, fifth sibling, but uh, first daughter. And at that point, again, mom and dad had had kids for 20 years. And again, they marched us through the school system for the next 25 years. And at this point, we're all getting to the point where grandkids should be popping up. Do you have a ex vivid childhood experience that stands out in your mind? Do you know, growing up here was really different. It really was like growing up in the Wonder Years. Um, 
the real trick was, I don't know as a parent nowadays whether I'd be comfortable doing it, but my parents had no problem with us jumping on a bicycle first thing in the morning on, in the summer and riding down to the beach and we stayed there all day. And the real trick was that there was always an adult around somewhere. There was a lifeguard on the beach and there was always a lifeguard when I was a kid growing up and everybody had to take swimming lessons. So again, I'd get up at nine o'clock, was the beginning of swimming lessons. We'd go down there and we'd freeze our little butts off and huddle on the dock and take our turns jumping in the water and jumping back out. And then we'd spend the day down there. And at some point we'd ride our back bikes back up to the house. But it really was one of those um, day after day summer times were just uh, a huge play session. A lot of people remember Pete Moss as the cross country instructor, cross country coach. And I remember him as that, but more I remember him as a child because he, um, he was a teacher. He, taught over at Honor, not a particularly great teacher, but he's a good teacher. But what he really was known for was his recreation programs. Um, Pete was out there every morning down at the, the baseball field in Benzonia and met, met all the kids. And we did everything from played baseball to played blooper ball to took bike rides to went down and um, did different activities down at the lake. But every day he had some kind of activity planned for us. Um, so we'd always meet with Pete Moss first thing in the morning in the summer. And that's the way we went through our whole summers. And I look at kids nowadays and I go, hmm, how is it that we were so limited back then, but we had so much more fun and we had so many more activities that we could do. And nowadays kids are like, whatever, and they're all hooked to their phones and there are no, what I consider to be public outlets, meaning their skate rink, they try to work out. But again, as I'm a kid, all summer long, we're playing with the recreation program all winter long, um, we're either skiing, skating or um, sledding and the ice skating rink was huge it was also at the Severed Street um, right where the bus garage is now that whole field was flooded and again Gordon Shively would keep that great Shively would keep that um, going all winter long and if you got tired of skating you put off your skates and you went down to the sliding hill and went sliding for a while there was always a warming hut always a fire out and again it was a, a great time to be growing up as a kid um, so what high school did you go to? My brother Dave was the first graduate of Bensey Central High School. Um, again, that means I went to Bensey Central. And literally, when I came back to Bensey Central in 19... Somewhere around 1996, I think, I started teaching at Bensey again. But I told the kids that I can still see my... where I carved my initials on the register out there in the, uh, the lobby that I had a lot of ghosts, so to speak. It's one thing to teach at a, a, a school, but it's another to come back and teach at a school. Because again, you remember growing up there, and I remember every one of the teachers I had, from Mrs. Smeltz, my kindergarten teacher, to Mr. Lynch, my high school um, physics teacher. Um, small community, and again, all the teachers kind of were much, I wouldn't want to say more personal, but certainly left an impression on the, the student population. And they were all part of our community, so everybody knew everybody. So what did you do after graduation? Did what everybody did, which is got out of Dodge. I, uh, again, didn't think about it when I graduated, but went to Ferris as a, uh, for photojournalism. Learned to use cameras like that, worked in a dark room for a number of years, worked uh, with newspapers and that. Um, but went from Ferris to Grand Valley, and at Grand Valley I got my teaching degree, and that's where all of a sudden I found out I was going to be just like my dad, Lord help me, and become an English teacher. Um, graduated from Grand Valley, and at the same point where I graduated from Grand Valley, my father passed away unexpectedly. Um, he was 49, which is fairly young. Um, trust me, when the four boys in our family all hit 49, we were going to the doctor and making sure our tunkers were working right. But in any case, my dad passed away at 49, and that was 1977, and um, I'd already been at school for four or five years. At a certain point, I quit going to classes and just came home and stayed with my mom for a couple of years. And uh, did that, ended up graduating from Grand Valley, and then came back and started what every kid considers to be the dream job, which is for the next five years, I was an instructor out at Crystal Mountain. Um, back in the old days, being an instructor was very different. Um, nowadays, when you go out to Crystal Mountain, there's probably, I don't know, a hundred, maybe more instructors. And these instructors uh, are all 
coming in and working their shifts and leaving. But back then there were about a dozen of us and we lived on premise and we did everything from shuttle paths um, during the bad days to parking cars kind of thing. But um, it was a very tight community. And again, we lived, I lived under the Main Street chairlift. That chair is gone now. Um, but every morning it was the same routine, which is at 5.30 in the morning, the chairlift started. And then the mechanical brake started, which went clunk, 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 clunk. And that went on all day long. So as soon as the chair started, everybody was up because again, all the dorms are right underneath the chairlift. But for the next five years, I lived at Crystal Mountain. And again, instructing there was a lot of fun. I, I worked year round, so I was living there in the summer also. And again, that was a great experience. Um, really, it's not what everybody thinks when it comes to, yeah, you think being a ski instructor is gonna be great, but it was a lot of just drudgery. But some fun moments in between and a whole lot of skiing, which was the best part. At the end of that, though, I realized at some point, because anybody who does ski instructing realizes you do that for two or three months and then you got the whole rest of the year to fill in. Um, I actually had a teaching degree and was offered a job at Mackinac Island. And I said, okay. So I packed up my bags and moved to Mackinac Island, and that was early, early 80s, probably 85 or 86, and lived on the island for a year with the kids. And everybody thinks that should be a teaching, teacher's dream because uh, my class sizes were anywhere from 6 to 13. Uh, my largest was 13. My smallest was actually 6. But it turns out that's not big enough to really have a very dynamic group, that the kids were pretty bored with each other and they weren't really into the academics. Most of them um, lived on the island year round. Mackinac Island at that point didn't have a, a graduation rate because it was only a K-8 school. If you wanted to go to high school, you had to go to the mainland. So a lot of the kids would drop out of school. Um, why? Because their parents were dray drivers and they were going to be a dray driver and they didn't care a whole lot about education. And a dray driver, by the way, is uh, those are the people that drive the horses around all the time. Um, there's a lot of the horse-driven um, carriages that you see with people in them, but when you think about the island and the island life, a lot more of it's got stuff in it. Now, most of the dray drivers are just hauling stuff from one point to another. And that's their life. And again, it's all good. Back Island was good, and, but not good enough to go back a second year. And like I say, I found the teaching to be um, remarkable in some ways and unremarkable in other ways. And so I, I left there and uh, moved back downstate. And my wife and I, at that point, moved to um, Ann Arbor for five years. While at Ann Arbor, I finished a couple other degrees, one of them in social work that I never used, family counseling and the other one was, though, in middle school, uh, methodology, and that's the one that got me back into teaching. So I worked through a, a teaching certificate again at um, Michigan State in their professional development program. And then I started teaching at Holt, which is a year-round school, and I taught there for four or five years. And at that point, everybody in the state was starting to really look at middle school model and what was it and how was it different than junior highs and the whole nine yards. And the principal at Vincy Central had knew that I was from Benzie Central and also knew that I had the middle school endorsements, etc. And they were really interested at Benzie in trying to make a middle school. And so they invited me in. I left my job down at uh, Holt and came up to Benzie Central. And that was about 30 years ago at this point. Um, but with the idea that was going to help transform Benzie Central Junior High into Benzie Central Middle School. What did that entail? It didn't work is what it entailed. What's the difference? Education's an interesting animal. Junior high is usually noted by eighth and ninth grade. Middle school, the only true definition of middle school is that it has to have a seventh grade. So if you've got a middle school, you might have a five, six, seven, you might have a six, seven, eight, you might have a seven, eight, nine, but it's got to include the seventh grade. The middle school model was one that was based on the notion that kids are not high schoolers yet and that they need more supervision and more support than a high schooler would. So it still included homeroom, it still included um, non-graded portions of the day, um, it still included bringing kids together in more of a, a social setting than a teaching setting. And all that stuff was great and it didn't work very well at Bibsy Central. Um, again, the, uh, the culture has always been one of, and I call it junior high. Junior high is different than middle school in that it's like high school but it's a small high school. It's like little high schoolers. They treat the junior high kids, though, the same way they would treat a high schooler. 
you break a rule, here's the consequence, you're going to get punished. Middle school, you break a rule, they talk about consequences, and sometimes they apply and sometimes they don't. But in middle school, there really was a lot of more of the supportive building of uh, uh, students than in high school and junior high, which is we're going to discipline you as needed and necessary. I always liked the middle school model. Like I say, it didn't work well throughout the state. Anybody who knows Benzie Central knows it's gone through some stages. That when I left Benzie Central, um, they were looking at junior highs at that point, and they went into what they called the open classroom. Remember, Benzie's a fairly new building. Um, it was built in the late 60s. And uh, by the late 70s, they had really come into this notion of uh, large group instruction kind of thing. And so the classroom I had, room 211, which I think Mr. Pauline is in now, and Mrs. Hahn's room next to it were all one big classroom. I mean, there was no wall separating those two. And somehow the teachers were supposed to be teaching with all that pandemonium and the kids milling around, et cetera, and it worked horribly. And they did that for a couple of years and they built a wall between the classes. And they started using uh, the junior high treating it just like a junior high, which meant everybody went to a class and 45 minutes later they got up and went to another class. Um, again, Benzie has experimented with a number of different models that way. But the bottom line is they keep coming back to the junior high model, which is Let's treat a 6th, 7th, and 8th grader just the same as we treat a 9th, 10th, and 11th grader. How do you feel about that? They're not the same. Um, anybody who's ever dealt with a 15-year-old boy and a 15-year-old girl and a 18-year-old boy and then a 12-year-old boy knows that they're not the same. Um, one of the reasons I liked middle school teaching, and again, I uh, have taught the range. I mean, I remember very clearly uh, teaching 5-year-olds. Five-year-olds climb you. I'm six six, two meters, and that was the first time I'd ever been climbed by little kids. But I found they enjoyed it, and I was like, "Wow!" Um, but little kids are very different, and then you get to seniors that it's hard to get them to focus on anything academically because they're out to lunch on you. Sandwiched in the middle there are those seventh graders, and the reason I stayed with middle school the entire time, um, and the thing I liked the most about middle school is that. They don't have a cloaking device. Oh. Adults all figure out some way to cloak. They hide the true selves. They try to make sure that people don't see the essence of them. Um, some are better at it than others, but seventh, seventh graders um, don't have a cloaking device. You can still pretty much see who they really are. That part I really liked. Um, I used to think when I was early teaching that you could make a profound impact on a seventh grader. And I realized that as time has gone on, it's harder and harder. When I was a seventh grader growing up, there was black and white TV and Lassie was on it. When I was teaching seventh graders, there was color TV and 50,000 deaths an hour. Um, so the kids are seeing an entirely different world than I saw. And unfortunately, it's a world that um, inures them to, or, or makes it hard for them to see the world that I saw, which was simple and it was the wonder years where you didn't worry about bad, bad things because, again, you're a little. Nowadays, you're a little, but you see all of it because there's color TV out there and it shows you all the, the grim parts of life. Um, I don't know that that's a good thing, to be honest with you. Education's blame for a lot. Um, the bottom line is the education paradigm in America is, is broken. I know that. Um, most educators know that, but politicians aren't the fix is the problem and they've been tinkering with education now um, for the last 20 years and making it worse um, to the point where right now it is really hard to find a teacher that's wanting to stay in the profession. And I don't blame them because if, uh, I retired early for a reason and it wasn't the kids. It was the politicians and the, uh, the process that they put education through and the responsibility they put on educators. Um, bottom line is you can't fix kids anymore. Um, they're coming pretty damaged to school, and some of them are coming really perfect to school. I mean, there are great parents out there still, that to be no doubt. But there's a lot of, in this area, demographics that don't support kids. And I found more and more as a teacher that it was harder and harder to reach most kids. There's a good 50% of our kids that are on free and reduced lunch. Those kids are going to have trouble regardless of what I do as a teacher. Um, and again, that's just the demographics of our area.
You're looking like you need to stop that. Yeah, I'm gonna pause it, but yeah. Let's... Because we didn't, we didn't know. It wasn't a matter of, I don't like you. It was a matter of, I don't know you. Um, when I grew up, there was the Allens, and Gene was the younger brother of Cindy, who was our homecoming queen. Yeah, um, And the Pauls. And again, they were two black families, and they were, I call them Oreo cookies, because they were black on the outside, but they were white. I mean, they, they, they'd never been to the city either. I mean, they didn't have any, so again, when you talk about, it's, it's not a nice thing to say. Um, it's not meant to be racial, but they were just normal, rural. Yeah, you told me he didn't experience any racial things until he went to Detroit. And that's when he was like, whoa. Well, and that's when I first met what I would call a black person, because I never thought of Eugene and, and Paul's as black. But then I went to Ferris, and there was a large black community there. Mm -hmm. And my first roommate was black, and he was black. I mean, he was from the city, and he had the talk, and, and he was a cool guy. I really liked him. But so, so different. I mean, I learned so much the first year at school where I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm sorry, but if you grow up up here, you're growing up in a very provincial neighborhood. I mean, again, we're all basically white middle class kids. Yeah. Um, and if there's a black kid here, he becomes another white middle class kid with us. Um, if there's an Asian kid, they become another white middle class kid because it's the only culture up here. There's not a big enough, you know. It's not diversity. Exactly. I mean, it's nothing against the Asians or the blacks or any other ethnic group. It's just there's not a large enough portion of them to have a, a culture. Yeah. So anybody who comes up here just becomes a boring old northerner. <laughs> Which it's like I say, it's an eye opener when you move out of the area and realize it's like, oh, we're different. <laughs> Okay, you're back to it? Back to it. Did you record all that? Uh oh. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, but is there any like, crazy teaching experience that stands out in your mind? Crazy teaching experience. Do you know, you could answer that two ways. It's like, as a learner and as a, a teacher, most people know Mr. Lynch. They've heard of him. Um, and again, you guys are interviewing some of the wrong teachers here because there's another group. Um, literally, my dad would be in his 90s. Um, most of those teachers are dead. Mr. Lynch and uh, Mr. Sheets and uh, Mr. Becker, and there's a whole group of those folks that um, all came in as junior, you know, that uh, the younger teachers when my dad was more in his middle ages. And that group of teachers now are in their 80s and 90s. But they literally were the last batch to come through Benzie with what I would call the old school. Um, Benzie Central went through, uh, there was a point where everybody knew everybody and most everybody was related to everybody. And someone like me, it was great because I could kiss anybody. But a lot of people, you had to be careful who you kissed. Why? Because they might be a second or third cousin. Go, oh, so again, if you're a gray at Benzie Central, no, you probably shouldn't be kissing a lot of people because they're related to 90% of the people that lived at Benzie. That all started to change, though, in the 70s. Um, you saw more and more kids moving up from downstate. Um, again, the, again, they're just that. They're moving up from downstate. And some of the, the families that have been here forever were still here, but they weren't quite as prolific. As I grew up, those families were still the kind of the mainstay of the community. The cases um, basically were in charge of Benzonia. When you talked about Asa Case, um, he ran the dealership, and Judge Case was the judge down there, and Frida was his wife who ran the, uh, was out of high school. That kind of started to fade in the 70s and 80s, where all of a sudden the community became much more diverse, and probably is a good thing. But it also lost its personality. It lost its, um, you know, sent to history that way in terms of some of these generational families that have been going on forever. Now there's, yeah, there's still the Grays and the Nugents out there, but there's also new families that no one's ever heard of that are part of the Benzie Central scene. Back to that though, growing up, um, Benzie Central was an FFA school. What's that mean? It was a future farmer school. If you went to Benzie, you could get a good degree, high school degree, but you could also really focus on farming, you could focus on um, mechanics, you could focus on shop. All of those things went away when the uh, politicians started getting involved in mandating this is, and that. They closed the shop, they really um, cut back the um, farming program, etc. 
And again, that's who we were. That's who all the schools up here were. Um, it was basically farming community schools. And like I can say, as we lost that identity, a lot of it through politicians closing different options for kids so that all of a sudden they have to all be taking college prep courses. Um, school became very different. I'm growing up though, Mr. Lynch is still one of the teachers that leaves impressions and again, he does things like has the milk, God, milk bottle parade, which is we built um, objects out of milk bottles to see if they'd float and it was all in, you know, physics and geometry class. He had catapult launching that I think Mr. Watterson and they probably are still doing in physics, but that started with Mr. Lynch to see how far we could throw things. He was also the teacher I had who every day would walk up to the chalkboard and throw his chalk at it. And sooner or later he assumed that it would pass through because most of the matter as we do was not really there but was empty space and he always assumed that at some point in time the chalk would fly through the chalkboard. It didn't but we always thought it was fun to watch him every day chuck it at it. And that kind of teaching seems to have passed away. Yeah. Like I say, I was uh, happy that I had, you know, personal relationships with all my teachers, and I hope that kids nowadays do. But nowadays there's so many other mandates and so many other pushes for teachers and students' time that that personal relationship sometimes gets pushed to the side. I do know that as a teacher, at some point, um, kids quit bringing Christmas presents. It used to be that a teacher, you could always pretty much guarantee, you know, half your class is going to bring you a card or bring you something to and all of that by the time I retired is pretty much a thing of the past. Teachers are still respected, but we're not looked at the same as the, my parents were um, in terms of the teaching. What was adapt adapting to retirement like? Adapting. This is present tense. I don't miss most of it. Um, I certainly don't miss getting up every morning at 5.30. I was one of those teachers that... Uh, hated to come to school on Monday morning ill prepared. So I spent my entire teaching career working on Sundays. And so I'd go out Sunday afternoons and get things ready for the, the weekend onslaught. And that part I don't miss a bit. Now I do miss kids, I do miss uh, you know just the calendar. It's surprising how quickly the school calendar falls away. You know, um, when you're in school, when you're part of that culture, the entire universe functions around a nine month calendar. Christmas is a huge deal. Why? Not because of anything other than the fact that there's a two-week vacation in there. Um, once you retire, none of that counts anymore. You don't even get weekends off because there aren't weekends. There's just another two days of the week. But there's no more holidays, um, no more special events, no more snow days, which is a bummer. Um, any of those things you find out about through the news, but they don't have any personal events anymore. Growing up, you know, snow days were great. As a teacher, who loves snow days. Um, as a retired person, like I say, all a snow day means is I have to get up and snow blow the driveway. Um, so it really takes all the fun out of that part of it. The waking up though and not having structured time is the trick to retirement. Um, teaching is an incredible amount of structured time. And what that means is that between prepping for your class grading your class, doing all the extracurriculars involved with your class and possibly coaching, um, probably 80 to 90 percent of your waking hours are structured as a teacher. This is talking about what you're talking about. <laughs> Just kind of like when you're retired, yeah. Let's talk about church for a minute. Yeah, let's talk about church. Just talk about church. I am certainly not a Christian as far as practicing Christian, but of that said, my parents were. Um, my dad was a Catholic and my mom was a Baptist. And if you know anything about those religions, that's probably a bad combination. Um, when my parents were married, it was two years before my mom's mother would speak to them again. Catholics do not marry Baptist, by the way, unless you don't know that, um, particularly Southern Baptist. Um, the culture is absolutely, totally different and the religion is very different when it comes right down to it. My mom um, literally went to certain churches where they spoke in tongues, meaning the Pentecost guys, where they talk with snakes and do all that kind of stuff. Yes, it was true Southern Baptist church. My dad was a Northern Catholic, and just as you'd expect Catholics to be very, very reserved in the way Catholics are. And that said, they moved up to Benzie County and became Congregationalist. 
Um, my mom gave up being a Baptist, my dad gave up being a Catholic, and the whole family went to the Benzonia Church, which is right next door here. And at that point in our community, if you look at Benzonia, um, Benzonia, land of clean air, this is a Christian community. It was founded on the church. Um, and again, that church has been the background of this community for over a hundred years. When my parents are there, everything is going strong. We're still in the old church, which is over there on River Road, not the, the new church. Um, and going to church is a, a weekly event. And at a certain point, the church had grown and it was uh, moving into the new building. And again, I remember as a child watching that, literally watching it be built um, and watching the stained glass out. In the, they laid that out in the, the uh, street for at least a week and a half to two weeks before they got it built as far as the new church. But all that was again laid on the ground as we we're watching it go up. The bottom line is everybody went to church. And literally on Sunday afternoons, you could walk home from church because we usually did, and everybody walked home from church. And now when I go to the church, I think, where is everybody? Um, no one goes to church anymore. You notice that in the classrooms. Um, when I was a teacher, um, when I was a student, and I went to church, if I misbehaved and I started squirming, because let's be honest, you're a little kid and church can be boring, and I would count the squares up there that had the um, stone glass in them. There's 217, by the way, from the top to the bottom. I still remember that number because I counted it every week. But if I squirmed, I got the claw. The claw was my mom who had very sharp nails reaching over and digging. And that told me to sit still. I could read the Bible, I could color, I could do whatever I wanted, but I couldn't squirm in the seat. I wasn't alone. Tom Crane was right next to me, and Mary Crane was next to him, and the Dufords were next to them, and every parent was next to their kid, and every kid that squirmed got the claw. Um, and we all learned the same thing, which is you don't mess around in public places and you don't misbehave, because someone's going to say something, and it's usually going to be your mom or your dad. Jump forward 50 years, and no one's going to church anymore. And what I noticed in the schools is kids have a huge lack of control. And I think, hmm, you don't have a mom that gave you the claw. And if you did, you probably wouldn't be acting like that. Um, I don't know that I push Christianity, but I do know as a culture, we've lost something. Um, and again, the church going that we used to do as a culture, whether or not you're religious, whether or not you're a Christian, the, the culture of going to church is something that everybody used to do, um, including graduation. Baccalaureate was always um, part of graduation. I don't think you guys go to baccalaureate anymore, do you? What's that? Aha! <laughs> You're a junior and you don't know about bac baccalaureate. Every senior before they graduated would go to baccalaureate. And that was the church sponsored senior event where basically it was like graduation, but the church acknowledging that you were graduating. And so there was a religious service that went with it. And the entire senior class went to it. And we quite often had one right here at the Benzonia Church. And the notion that you don't know what it is tells me everything I need to know about what happened to our religion in the county. Again, it's not so much that you need to be Christian or Jewish or Muslim. It's that you need to have a uh, cultural center. And our church and this library used to be it. And anymore, there's not. And when you look at small communities, they don't have cultural centers to them anymore. And it's unfortunate for people like you, because again, you don't have those the, the, the guidelines, so to speak, the parameters that are set up for kids that say, hey, do this and you're going to get the claw. Um, you know, the, nowadays kids do things and what they see on TV is anything's acceptable. And what I see in the classroom is a lot of goofy behavior. Um, what I don't miss as a retiree is a lot of goofy behavior. Um, more and more of the kids are given more and more permission to act out. And it's like, no, 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 no. I don't care if you're bored or not, you, you can learn to sit still just like any other kid. Um, like I say, for me, that has been a huge cultural shift. Um, it's along the religious lines, but more than that, it's along the cultural lines within our communities. Benzonia always had a personality. Beulah had a personality. Um, growing up, uh, the Beulah Benzonia boys and girls were quite often college prep kids. Um, many of our parents, for whatever reason, were um, professionals. Not true always, but you know, the way we looked at it, honor was a redneck town. 
you'd get beat up if you went over there. And uh, we knew that. Kokmish, it was a redneck town. You could get beat up if you went over there. So the Beulah Benzonia kids, again, we were the Lakeys. We had Crystal Lake as our background. Um, but we always considered ourselves the cool kids. And again, we I liked the Frankfurt, excuse me, the Honor kids, um, but knew that that was a rough crowd. And it was the same thing with the Kokmish group, the Whitehall, as they called it, because there was a Whitehall dance community over there. They all danced on Saturday nights. It was a pretty rough community. And then everybody knew about Frankfurt. And that was a whole different thing. They were our enemy. Frankfurt. Same kind of culture, again, when you're thinking about changes. It's 1964 and something's happened at the political level of the states and they're consolidating school. Before that, they have all these agricultural schools everywhere. Um, when I'm in fifth grade, Tom Hopkins joins us from Joyfield and he's joining us from Joyfield because Joyfield is closed and it's the last one-room schoolhouse in the area. So Tom's been going to a one-room schoolhouse up until fifth grade and then all of a sudden he's joining Benzins. It's not Benzie Central yet, it's still Benzonia, Crystal Lake School. But shortly thereafter, Benzie Central forms and Frankfurt is the only school that doesn't join. So there's a Copemish school, you can still see the old green building in Copemish. There's an honor school, there's a Beulah school, Beulah Benzonia. They all become a co-op and they look at the county and they literally take a little, um, I don't know, they find that this here, the center point of Benzie County is where the school is. Literally, that's like equidistance everywhere in the county. What they don't realize is it's in the middle of nowhere. Everybody's going to have to drive their entire life going to that school. But the reason the high school is where it is is because of a land grant, meaning they had the, the land out there, and it is geographically smack dab in the middle of the county and all the other schools closed and went to that one except for Frankfurt. And that started the rivalry. Um, so for the next 70 years, the frankfurt Benzie rivalry has been going on, sometimes heated, sometimes kind of cooling, depending on the year and the conditions. Um, as a ski coach, it is 2006. Sorry. 2005 or 2006, and we co-op with the Frankfurt school system. It's the first time there's a co-op there, and the football players are outraged. The basketball players are like, you're co-oping with who? Um, and again, with us, it's a perfect co-op, because Frankfurt hasn't had a ski team for the last four or five years. Um, they've got some good skiers over there, and again, they're not buying into it much either. I mean, the Frankfurt kids happen to be called Benzy skiers. And that has never really gone away. You probably notice it still, that there's still some tension between the Frankfurt, particularly that Frankfurt group of boys that's there now. Um, they have been fairly hostile. The early Frankfurt kids though, Eric Baumler, Wiley Heller, um, there's a group of them that were all in those first co-op teams with us, um, were very much just Benzie kids. Meaning they didn't bring a, a Frankfurt personality with them. And that part has always worked really well. Um, Frankfurt, Benzie, I know tried to do a co-op soccer team and that didn't pan out very well. They ended up dissolving that. I think they've done that both on the boys and girls. I think they tried to do it cross country at one point and that one didn't work. Um, but the ski team is stuck, you know, and again, I think that will continue to um, right on through. It's the lone exception to that rivalry though. Like I say, if you talk football, I'm sure your dad can tell you there's a lot of teams you need to beat, but there's one team you can't lose to, and that's Frankfurt. Um, and, uh, like I say, I know as your dad is a coach, he's probably had to inherit some of that. Um, we beat them last season, did you see? I did. You know, and it's interesting that uh, I think they played about 70-something times. And the record's actually, it's gone back and forth. I mean, there's been some years where both teams have had just dominant teams. But by and large, it's a pretty even track record. Um, you know, it's pretty close to about 30 and 30 in terms of the wins and losses. And Frankfurt, if you know, is obviously a football town. I mean, they live and breathe sports over there, particularly football and baseball. Um, but they're actually a much smaller school than we are. So for them to be competitive the whole time, it's like, hmm. Is there anything that you want to share about your experiences that you never really have? Good question. 
Do you know, it really was the wonder years. Um, growing up in a, uh, an era where you don't get goofy looks from adults if you're doing something, you know. I.e. there's no such thing as a terrorist when I'm growing up. That word was not invented, so you couldn't have terrorism because there weren't terrorists and you couldn't have, to, none of that stuff happened. Um, everything broke for me in 19, basically my high school years. Um, you could see America breaking because that was Vietnam. My senior year, um, 1972, was the last year of the draft. You guys don't know about the draft, but you know when I uh, used to teach a uh, lesson to the, in my classes, what are they called? The lottery. And again, everybody's heard of the lottery. Most people have heard of the lottery because you can go to Stapleton's and, and win money. Um, but this lottery was the draft. And again, you know, Shirley Jackson, who wrote the lottery, was writing about a different story, but it was that whole thing of it wasn't good to win, it was bad to win. And the last year that I was a senior um, was the last year of the draft, meaning that um, there are a lot of Benzie kids that you can find their name on the um, Vietnam Memorial. And that changed everything. All of a sudden, there was a, a break. And the break's gotten worse and worse to the point now where if you're a Republican, you think Democrats are freaking socialists. And if you're a Democrat, you think Republicans are neo-Nazis. It started in Vietnam um, with the war hawks and the doves. Um, and again, I'm a senior learning about all that. And we're watching Vietnam daily on the news. And that's right when color is coming out, by the way, too. It's, you don't think about that because technology has happened so fast. But the 60s are black and white days. What's that mean? You watch Lassie and you watch Captain Kangaroo and you watch TV and it was in black and white. And somewhere in the 70s, color came and it changed everything because we could graphically see Vietnam and we could see war crimes being committed and we could see people dying in the fields and all of a sudden everything was not quite the same as it had been before. That part, you know, I'm really glad I, I grew up before it. Uh, I feel sad for the people who grew up afterwards because they really didn't get the same look. I'm not sure that it's bad, it's just very different. And that's you guys, so, you know, life sucks to be you. <laughs> but I really do think, again, in terms of my life in school, that that was the Vietnam War. And for me, that was 68 through 72. Good news is, 1972, I graduate. My birthday is September 14th. And the way they did the lottery was they would put all the birthdays into this big, big thing, just like they do the, the state lottery now. And they'd reach in, they'd pull out a number, and it would say, September 14th, if that was the first ball they pulled out, that meant your lottery number is number one and you're going to Vietnam. Um, if they reached in like my brother Pat and they pulled out 347, he didn't go to Vietnam. He didn't get drafted because they didn't get that far. What they did with the draft is if you had one, they called all the ones and you all went in to the draft board, twos and threes. And they did that up until they got the number they needed. That might be 100 or it might be 200. But my brother Pat, was 360 or something like that. He got out of the draft. My final year, the it's year in high school, I'm a senior, it's the final year of the draft. If I'm a freshman in college, my number is number one because they pulled up my birthday, my senior year. But I'm still in high school, so I'm like, hey, hey you can't get me. And the next year they quit the draft. Um, so I never got drafted or never was called for it. But I remember very clearly my buddies older high schoolers getting the number and getting the call and say, oh, you know, and deciding whether or not they wanted to do that or not. And I also remember the Denny Kitzmans, who's around the Vietnam Wall, um, you know, that they went back and went there and never came back. And for me, again, it was life changing, but it was also cultural changing. You know, the community changed at that point. Did you know any draft dodgers? You know, I don't know of any draft dodgers. I know of, there are people protesting up here, um, but including my mom. <laughs> She's one of those protesters, met right out in front of the, the post office here. But like I say, it was a, a pivotal time. I'm glad I lived on the other end of it. Um, I feel sorry for you guys that didn't. How do you feel living in Benzie County versus living in a bigger city? 
Do you know there's a story about the country mouse and the city mouse? And it's always, it's funny because they, they talk about how hard it is for the country mouse, etc., but it's really not. It's much easier to be a country mouse than it is to be a city mouse. Um, I don't miss the city a bit. My wife and I lived down in, the, in Ann Arbor area for a few years, and uh, the commutes, etc., are absolutely a pain in the ass, let's be honest. Um, driving in the city is a pain. But the depersonalization is a pain. Up here, you might not like it, but everybody knows you. Um, and again, it's a good and a bad thing, but it's really a good thing. Because if something happens, everybody knows. And down there, no one knows and no one cares. So, I'm born in Rio. Take that back. Wasn't born here. Was raised here. Um, raised my son here, and I'm really glad I raised him here. He was born downstate, and uh, we moved up here when he was in third grade, and he was sure he wanted to be a city boy. Um, first two or three years, he said, "Oh, we really missed him because we were living in Lansing at the point, and he wanted to go back to Lansing." And then we went back to Lansing one time, and he saw his neighborhood and saw his house, and went, "Oh, I don't want to be here anymore." And, from fifth grade on, he gave it up, and you know he's been a northerner ever since. And the bottom line is, you can go to the city and enjoy things, but it's hard to come to the city and enjoy being up here. The, the pace is so different. Um, I would take this over the city life any day. Could you say one sentence that best describes Benzie County? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to chew on that a minute. Oh, Say that again? Just like a few words. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I don't know about a few words. Bitsy County is kind of like a tale of two cities. It's the best of places and the worst of places. You're not going to get rich here. In fact, you're going to have trouble making a living here. But if you can figure out how to survive up here, there's no better place to be. Um, my wife's a Uper. She's from Marquette. And it's actually a native Uper, meaning that she can trace her family back a couple generations. And she says the same thing about the UP, which is there's a culture that you can't mimic, you can't copy. Um, can't reproduce, and you won't find it anywhere else but there. Um, Benzie County is the same way. There's a culture here that's non-reproducible. I mean, it's the culture that produces the Rick Schmitz, which make us uh, have the next home brew, so to speak, in terms of uh, the bar he created over there and also the Five Shores that's going in down at Beulah. Those kinds of things are pulling in people but there's something about the area that's keeping him here and keeping him wanting to best in this. That's the part that keeps me here. And that's the part where I'll stay retired here versus moving somewhere else. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we haven't covered already? Life in general? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not unless you've got things that you need to hear still.